Shannon. I'm the Executive Director of the Lincoln County Historical Association, and I'm so happy to be welcoming so many people to the Zoom tonight. This is very exciting for us. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. This is the first in a series of lectures that we're offering this winter, and we're kicking it off with a big turnout. Um, offering this remotely is allowing us to share the content with over 900 people, uh, which is just staggering. Many of those folks are here now. Others will watch the video recording that I'll send out after the talk, and you should receive that within the next week. Before I move on to some housekeeping, I'd like to give a shout out to our program sponsor, Embark Main Tours. Um, Embark stepped up to help us out with unanticipated costs associated with hosting an unexpectedly large event. Um, Embark is based in Bath and they offer historical walking tours. I highly recommend you check them out. As I mentioned, this is the first in a series of lectures that we're proudly offering this year. Next up will be put in their place Criminalizing the Other with Amy Keithen. Dr. Keithen's talk promises to introduce new perspectives and she'll get us thinking about those who were accused of crimes in early New England. She'll share how social biases impacted prisoners' lives. And through this talk, we'll begin to restore the humanity and stories of the individuals who history has suppressed. Please visit our website to sign up and learn more. And from there, you'll find some of the other things that we have coming up later this month and um, next month. But now on to this evening's event. There are so many people on this Zoom, it's important that everyone please remain muted throughout. As questions arise, you are welcome to put them in that chat box. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will read your questions to Kate at the end of the program. We'll have a 15 minute Q&A session. At this time, oh, I'm going to pause just a moment to invite some more people in from the waiting room. All right, looks like everyone's here. I'm now happy to introduce tonight's speaker, Kate McBrien. Kate is ser currently serving as the Maine State Archivist. She's overseeing the Maine State government's archives and records management programs. She was the curator of the award-winning exhibition, Malaga Island, Fragmented Lives. And she's also a historian for the Malaga Island community. Thank you, Kate, so much for being here this evening. I'm so happy to turn things over to you right away so we can start learning more about the story of Malaga Island. I'm gonna stop my screen share and move it on to you. Awesome, thank you. At first I couldn't unmute, so thank you so much, Janet. I really appreciate it. And thank you all so much for joining us. I am absolutely thrilled um, that this many people are interested in learning more about Malaga Island, um, a very important community in Maine, um, as well as a really important part of our history and our state history. Um, so I'm thrilled to see you all here. Some of you may have heard some of this before. Um, some of you may have heard of Malaga Island and you're curious just to hear more of what really happened. And so that's what we're gonna to share tonight. Um, before I get started though, I did wanna mention um, a program that is gonna be offered next week. I also, beyond serving as a Maine State Archivist, I also serve on the Place Justice Advisory Council, uh, which is a, a group of professionals who are advocating um, for looking at the history of our places in Maine, um, looking at offensive place names, but also uh, who have we named our places after and what is the history associated with that? So we're going to actually um, launch that uh, effort with a program on Tuesday, February 7th at five o'clock. Um, you'll hear from, if, if any of you would like to join us, you'll hear from Maine House Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross and Penobscot Tribal Ambassador Molly and Dana um, about the four de decades and four bills of dealing with offensive place names and symbols in Maine. That will be offered on Zoom as well. So I hope you go um, search for the Place Justice uh, Advisory Council in Maine um, on Google and you will find us. So with all of that, Malaga Island. Um, this is a topic that is very dear to my heart. I have been researching uh, the community who lived on Malaga Island for 20 years now. 
And I still feel like there's so much more to uncover and learn. Uh, so what I wanted to share with you uh, today is a little bit of that journey, some of the information that I have found. Um, I'll be very honest about the things that we haven't found yet, and I just don't know yet. Um, but I hope you will ask some questions at the end. As Shannon mentioned, please put those in the chat, because I always find with Okay, I think I accidentally muted you. That's okay. Can everyone hear me now? <laughs> awesome. We're good. We're good. No problem. Um, so we are, um, we're going to dive a little bit into that history, but please ask some questions in the chat because it's so much more interesting when it's a conversation. I'll be perfectly honest. I usually give this talk for like 20 people. So it's easy to have a conversation. I think we're up to 456 now. It's a little bit more complicated of a conversation, but we can still do it. I have no doubt. So let me get started. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you will all tell me if you can see it. Can you all see that screen? I see nodding heads. I love it. Thank you. So Malaga Island, Maine, a little bit about myself. I first discovered or came across Malaga Island uh, when I was an intern at the Pajepscott History Center in Brunswick. Uh, my summer project was to research the black history of Brunswick. And I stumbled on, the, on this place called Malaga Island and was really surprised to find that I had never heard of it. So I kind of tucked it away. It wasn't part of Brunswick, so I wasn't going to focus on it, but it was one of those stories I kept coming back to. I kept stumbling on, finding a little bit more information. Um, so then I really dug in deep. One of the places that I found a lot of information was at the Maine State Archives, and it was actually even before I worked here. The Maine State Archives, I always have to give a plug for where I work, um, if those of you are not familiar, we are actually an agency of Maine state government. Our mission is to preserve the records created by state government and to make those accessible to all of you. So really without an archives, you can't have a transparent government because you can't have the records to see what your government is doing. And that's really what my role is. What makes this so important is that because the state of Maine was involved in the lives of the Malaga Island residents, they kept records and documents about that community. And that's one reason why we know so much about what happened there. Much of the research that I did um, stems from an exhibit uh, that I put together at uh, the Maine State Museum. It opened in 2012, was open for one year called Malaga Island Fragmented Lives. So for those of you who are not aware, Malaga Island is located at the mouth of the New Meadows River in Phippsburg, Maine. It's a tiny island right off of the Sabasco area of Phippsburg, super close to the mainland. You can stand on the mainland right by Anna's Waterfront Restaurant, and you can holler to someone over on Malaga on a, on a clear day. You almost feel like you can throw a baseball. It's kind of how I reference it. That's how close it really is. It's a 42 acre island. It's really rocky, covered in scruffy pine. And there are several theories for how the community who came to live on Malaga Island got there. Most of them trace back to one man. His name was Benjamin Darling. He was an African-American man, probably formerly enslaved. And he purchased Horse Island, which was right next to Malaga in 1794. He married a white woman named Sarah Proverbs, who was from the Phippsburg area, and they raised their family on Horse Island. For some unknown reason, in the mid-1850s, his family sold Horse Island, and they scattered to the nearby islands. And in doing this, this was actually a really, really common occurrence in coastal Maine. Islands were not very attractive places to live. It was a hard life. You are separated from the mainland and resources and communities. So it made sense that if you just needed some land uh, to live on, no one else was using it. You know, you could just put a home on an island, nobody really cared. And so that's what this community did. That's what Darling's descendants did. Although the records are not super clear, 
Uh, we believe that Henry Griffin and his family were most likely the first to land on the community, on the island. They set up um, house first on the east side of the island in 1863. Very quickly though, as soon as they set up uh, a house, more people joined. It was like a sister and, a, and her family and then a cousin and his family. And so that's how this community really grew. They were all descendants of Benjamin Darling in some way and connected through familiar ties in some way. And life on Malaga Island was really as difficult as it was on any main island in the late 19th century. Members of the community were poor. They all fished, all of them were fishermen, but just like everyone's always done in Maine, they fished and then they had another job as well. And that was the case for the entire community. They earned a living in any way that they could and they interacted with the mainland regularly and peacefully. Unfortunately, because uh, this family, this community stood out as a little bit different. There were a lot of myths that grew up around them, uh, stories and rumors that spread throughout the state of Maine, throughout New England. They were different in the way that they were a mixed race community. They were black people and white people living together, marrying, having children, and that to 19th century Maine seemed different. And because it was different, people started telling stories, whether they were true or not, and they weren't true. Some of the myths uh, that very quickly grew up talked about a community that was very secluded. They spread stories about theft and inbreeding. Um, they said they were all illiterate. When you look at newspapers uh, from Maine at the time, they actually talked about um, a degenerate colony is how they refuse as is how they refer to them. Where there was wife uh, wife swapping and incest, very common. None of this was true, but this is what was written in the newspapers. It even got to the point where I found a newspaper article that said that the children had horns growing out of their head and they were living in tunnels on the island. I mean, that's how extreme a lot of the reporting and the stories uh, were happening. Postcards like the one you see here were sold nationwide. Uh, this is uh, a postcard, photograph postcard of two people who did live on Malaga Island. I know that older woman is Elizabeth Darling and the young child on her lap is Pearl Tripp, uh, but it's a very staged photograph. They're put behind a fence to look like they're penned in animals. The title, the postcard was titled a very racist name. So this was the story that was getting spread uh, actually as far away as the West Coast of America. It went across the nation. So these are the stories. This is what people heard, but reality was very different. Families certainly struggled to meet their basic needs, but they built homes. They educated their children. They interacted with the mainland community peacefully and as much as they needed. So there was the myths and then there was the truth. One reason we know so much of the truth of, of how this community actually lived is because University of Southern Maine archeologists uh, led by Nathan Hamilton and Rob Sanford, they dug on Malaga Island uh, for several years. And through archeology, span through the artifacts that actually belong to these people, we know the truth. We know that the myths were not accurate at all. The USM archaeologists dug at the uh, three house sites. They dug at the McKinney house, the Henry Griffin house site, and the Eason house site. And if you're looking at the picture, uh, for those of you who live in Maine, some of this will look familiar and that the archaeological dig pit is not, they're not digging right into soil and sand. They were actually digging into a shell midden. Um, so processed shells that made this big mound, um, you know, sea fish shells. And that's what the Malaga Island residents built their houses on, was on top of shell middens on Malaga Island. And their archaeology work found uh, that generally this island community lived like any other main island community. They worked, they cooked meals, they cleaned their house. A lot of their possessions were secondhand. 
Their ceramics tended to be uh, styles that were really popular decades before, but some households like the Eason's had several items that were very current to the early 20th century. This is a bowl with a design that would have been really popular uh, right at the, the turn of the 20th century. The archeologists found hundreds of pieces of clay pipes. Uh, clay pipes um, were sort of disposable pipes that were used in the 1700s and 1800s. They were very popular on Malaga Island, it seems, because they found hundreds of pieces of them. They also found textile fragments and pieces of shoes, which really told us that the community there was using things up until they couldn't use them anymore. And that's when they would throw them out. So with all of this evidence, with the documents that I could find at the state archives um, and some other places from the archeological evidence itself, let's take a look and see um, what we know about the people, the individuals who actually lived on Malaga Island. This is the home of the Griffin family on Malaga. It was right at that north end at the beach. That's really the only decent landing place. So that's where the community formed. Henry Griffin married Tina um, Darling, uh, probably in the early 1860s. Tina had actually uh, grown up on Bear Island, which was right next to Malaga. So when she married and it was time for them to set up a family, they just kind of hopped over a channel and set up their home on Malaga Island. Henry had grown up in the Phippsburg area. He was a fisherman. Um, and I'm sure just by being in the local region, that's how they met. R living right next to them, and probably the second family to move to Malaga, was the McKinney family. James Eli McKinney was also from Phippsburg, but he was white. He married Salome Griffin, um, the daughter of Henry and Tina, Tina Griffin. And they set up their home right next to her parents. This is the McKinney house. It was actually considered one of the nicest houses on the island. It's a nice, small two-room cape. If you drive around coastal Maine, there's most of our houses still look like this. So this was actually a really decent little house. The very first recorded birth on the island was um, the McKinney's daughter, Louisa. And I say the first recorded birth only because she was born in 1871. It's certainly possible that someone could have been born on the island beforehand, but because we don't have a um, birth registration or something documented to show, this is the first one that we know that's actually documented. So Louisa McKinney, she spent her childhood on Malaga Island, um, lived there, married, started her own family on Malaga. So you see Louisa here with her three sons. Her dad, Jim McKinney, by 1900 was really well known uh, in the press and in the local area. He was referred to as the King of Malaga. Now in a fishing community, the King is usually the best fisherman, tended to be a little bit of a spokesperson for the community. Um, and so that was a, a term that was given to Jim McKinney. I will admit though, I tend to think that as the white man on the island, he may have been given that term as well by the press. Um, and the press certainly quoted him most often, most likely because they were more comfortable speaking with him than, than anyone else. In fact, his uh, obituary in 1916 described him this way. I'll read you a quote. It says, Jim McKinney was perhaps the most picturesque character that lived on the little Emerald Island of Malaga. He seemed to possess a little more education than the others on the island, and they accordingly carried all their troubles to him and he settled them. He was also really well known for uh, his uh, fiddle playing. So he actually performed up and down the New Meadows River, uh, performing for, for groups and at resorts. Another family uh, that we know so much about is the Eason family. This is a photo of John Eason uh, building either a, a home, possibly a barn on Malaga Island. John was a stonemason and a carpenter, but just like everyone else, he also fished. He was known uh, for his fine singing voice actually. Uh, so people would come to hear him sing. 
And uh, on the islands, they nicknamed him the deacon because when the islanders couldn't make it to the mainland to attend church, uh, he would actually preach to them. John married Rosella Griffin uh, and they lived on Malaga Island. They married in 1886. And you can see them here in front of their house. Um, I'm actually gonna go back for a second. So if you can see this house, this picture, fabulous picture. It's, it's on a glass plate negative. So it's a very, very good resolution. Um, but we didn't, we could never tell what she was holding until we did a really high resolution scan and could zoom in. And once we did, we figured out what she was holding. It's their pet cat, which I just love. I'm, a, I'm an animal person. I love the fact that they felt the need to show their pet in their family portrait as well. Now, this photo is interesting for another reason, really for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that it tells us so much uh, that really debunks a lot of the myths. You know, one of the myths of Malaga Island is that people lived in shacks and there were no windows and dirt floors. Well, you can see windows here and siding on the house. Um, another of the myths was that on Malaga Island, they had no way to heat their homes or cook their food, but you see a chimney. So that doesn't really make any sense, right? Um, they also, one of the myths was that they couldn't feed or take care of themselves. But in this photo, you see a little fenced in area in front of the house, that's their little vegetable patch. And in the back, you can see another fenced in area where they kept some animals. Uh, so again, just by looking at one photo, we can debunk many of the stories and myths um, that spread all over the coast. The other thing that's interesting about this photo is that we actually know the exact date it was taken. Uh, this photo was taken by a photographer from Gardner, Maine. His name was Herman Bryant. And he wrote on the sleeve to the glass plate negative that he took this photo on July 20th, 1911. Now with that date, we know that just six days before he went out to Malaga and took this picture, just six days before, newspapers reported that Maine's attorney general uh, had decided that someone else owned the island, that the people who lived there did not have legal title to it. And then we know that 11 days after this photo was taken, newspapers reported that the family that the state said owned the island had filed papers to evict everyone there. So this photo is taken in this interesting window where the residents of Malaga Island know the state has decided someone else owns where they've lived for 50 years, but they don't yet know what's gonna happen. So I always wonder when I look at this photo, what are they thinking? And what do they think of this person who's coming out to take their picture? So let's take a look and try to dive in a little bit about what happened. So why is the state suddenly getting involved and, and deciding what's going to happen with this island, who owns it, what happens with the community? And like anything, it's complicated. There's a lot going on all, all at once. So in the very early 20th century, uh, Maine was seeing a very rapidly changing economy. Uh, we were going away from a uh, wooden ship building industry with new technology as steamships and railroads came to be. So Maine saw a huge decline in the shipbuilding industry, which really badly affected the Pittsburgh area. That was their main industry. We also saw a serious decline in the amount of fish that were available in the ocean. So there was more competition between fishing communities. So as jobs disappeared and more and more people around coastal Maine um, needed some help to buy food, to pay for medical expenses, they turned to their towns for assistance. This was before there was any state or federal programs. Um, everyone would apply to a town uh, for financial assistance when needed. Um, and so that's what the community on Malaga Island did. As they were doing that, uh, Maine as a state decided that if Fish, you know, if fishing was down and the shipbuilding industry was declining, we needed a new industry. We needed a new economy to keep our state going. And that's when Maine turned towards tourism as being the new economy, the new industry that would save us. All of this is happening right as the eugenics movement uh, is starting in, in America. 
and really taking off. So eugenicists uh, believed that all of society's problems, all of the struggles with um, theft or alcoholism or illiteracy, that according to eugenicists, that was all um, genetically based, that it was built into someone's DNA and could be passed down through generations. They also believed that these groups with, with these, what they saw as societal problems would form, families would form and they would gather and that therefore the only way to fix society's problems were to break up these communities. They tended to, to refer to them as uh, groups that needed to be cleaned up and dispersed. You can see here, the screen that we're looking at is actually a uh, eugenics chart uh, for the Marx family who lived on Malaga Island. Um, this was something that the state of Maine created. Um, looking back, uh, the Marx family or the, the group of black uh, letters in the in the lower sort of left corner. Um, you can all you can see that it's all letter F. F stood for feeble minded, which is a eugenics based term uh, for lack of intelligence in their opinion. Um, and then you can see where there's other black Fs uh, where they were trying to go through the family tree and see where there's other in their determination feeble mindedness in the family and trying to trace the genetics. And it was under the eugenics movement that really now commonly used terms such as moron, imbecile, idiot, uh, those all came into really common use, as well as terms like juvenile delinquent or gifted child. Those are all, those all stem from the eugenics movement. And it was these terms that actually became medical diagnoses for people. So anyone who was living a life um, that was seemed to be out of the norm could be identified um, as feeble-minded within the eugenics movement because it's not what was expected. While all of this is going on around the Malaga community uh, and associated, very often associated with the eugenics movement, uh, are missionaries. And that certainly applied for the Malaga Island community as well. George and Lucy Lane were missionaries from a church in Malden, Massachusetts. They bought a, a house, a summer house on Horse Island right near Malaga. Um, and they came looking for a project, literally. There's actually a letter from George Lane that he wrote to a friend in 1911. And this is what he wrote. I quote, we built our summer house on the north end of Harbor Island, then Horse Island and being interested in looking after people who need help, found what I was looking for on Malaga Island." Unquote. The Lanes really focused their attention on educating the children and teaching what they saw as moral values to the children and the women of Malaga Island. They never seemed to mention the men. I'm not sure that they paid attention to them much, but they focused their efforts on the children and the women. They opened the island's first school in 1906, and they operated it from one room of the McKinney house, which you see here. And they had their daughter Cora serve as the teacher. By the next year, the, the uh, school had actually grown uh, to 14 students. So the class had to move to the larger room in the McKinney house uh, to fit them all. With the success of the school, uh, the Lanes actively raised funds to build a permanent school building on the island, which they did. Uh, they also raised funds to help pay for food and clothing for the Malaga Island residents. By 1908, they had opened this school building and they worked with the state's Department of Education to put a teacher out on the island for the summer. The school was so successful that one mainland student paid tuition to attend. He would actually row over to attend the school. And as you can see here, the children received an education. They learned to read and write. Uh, they were taught mathematics and history. Um, I saw one letter that mentioned they uh, were taught some trades as well. This letter that you see here is from a girl on the island named Abby Marks, and she's writing to Mrs. Lane asking if she'll come visit soon. And those are all her X's and O's at the bottom. 
Now, part of the state's response, they not only sent a teacher uh, to live out on Malaga Island, but they became more involved. In 1903, as um, the residents of Malaga Island were seeking support from financial support from the town, and the town was looking for tourism to really be the new industry to take over, uh, the town of Phippsburg became concerned that they were being associated with this uh, community on Malaga, something that they didn't want to be associated with at the time. So in 1903, the town of Phippsburg petitioned the state legislature to say, you know what? We don't think Malaga Island is actually within Phippsburg, so we don't think we're financially responsible for them. We think Malaga belongs to Harpswell, which is a neighboring town. Um, the legislature, fortunately, at the time said, no, nice, nice try. It's definitely in Phippsburg. Um, but the state legislature, it, it definitely caught someone's attention. Um, because by 1905, the state did become involved. They made the entire community on Malaga Island wards of the state, which meant the state would oversee their care um, and they would have to apply to the state for any uh, financial need, which literally meant the state uh, appointed an agent, uh, someone who was local in Phippsburg, who would go visit the island. And those folks on the island would have to ask the agent for money for any cost that they had. It could be for food, it could be for clothing, it could be for medical expenses. But imagine you need to go to the store to go buy some milk and some meat and some vegetables. You would have to go to the agent and say, can I have some money for some food? And that is how it works. So we actually have receipts and documents um, of that interaction um, and what the Malaga Island residents purchased uh, here at the state archives. This happened, this continued on for a few years um, until in 1911, um, the agent at the time in Phippsburg, his name was George Pease. He issued a report to the governor and the executive council of Maine. Uh, George Pease, uh, I think, decided there was, was getting some pressure, deciding something needed to be done. Uh, so he went through and wrote a report that described every resident who lived on Malaga Island, uh, listing them by families. He made sure to list the race and the age of every person who lived there. He then listed what he believed was their work ethic, if they were lazy or not. He also listed his opinion on their intelligence level. Um, so he freely described people as feeble-minded, without any basis, it's just his opinion. At the end of the report, uh, he summarized uh, with some suggestions of what he thought should happen. His suggestion was that the state should own the island. He actually wrote, it could then prevent people from settling there and turn off the undesirable ones. He then listed where he thought each of the families could go. You could order this family you know, to Phippsburg, order this one to Harpswell. Um, he said that we could place uh, Mrs. Annie Parker in the home for the feeble-minded because she is a fit subject. He also suggested that a two and a half year old child of Lizzie Marks could be given to Mrs. Hunt at Portland because she wants the child. And this was his official report to the governor, to the executive council of the state of Maine. And to me, this is very, very telling because it doesn't list the people as individual people and how do we help them. It lists them as problems that had to be dealt with. So it shows a lot about the mindset and the approach um, of state government towards the Malaga Island community at the time. And his, his report certainly got attention. Very soon after, Governor Playstead uh, and his executive council landed on Malaga Island. This was such an event uh, that there was actually a postcard made of uh, the governor landing on the island. During his visit, Governor Playstead uh, remarked um, that he was encouraged to see the progress of the children in the school, but he was not convinced that the community would ever accept a middle-class style of living, is how he put it. He remarked, uh, according to the local newspaper at the time, that the best plan would be to burn down the shacks with all their filth. Certainly the conditions are not credible to our state and we ought not to have such things near our front door. And I do not think that a like condition can be found in Maine. 
although there are some pretty bad localities elsewhere. Very quickly after that, the governor ordered the attorney general to figure out who held a deed to the island. The attorney general decided that the Perry family in Phippsburg held a deed that the state would honor. And uh, within just a matter of weeks, the Perry family filed papers in court to evict the community. In a report of the executive council for that year, they devoted an entire section to Malaga Island. They stated, there has been here heretofore, and some are existing at the present time, certain pauper colonies that have been for years a disgrace to the adjacent communities and a blot upon the state. We refer particularly to Malaga Island, Athens, and Frenchboro. The report then described their decision to evict, to evict the islanders this way. After conditions, after viewing conditions, it was decided at a council meeting shortly after that the good of the state, and then this always gets me, and the cause of humanity demanded that the colony be broken up and the people segregated. And that to prevent further squatting, the state decided it should hold title to the island. This is all after the governor and the executive council had visited the island. And so I've always wondered, so what was that visit really like? We see a picture of them landing, but what was the interaction actually like? Through a letter um, by Mrs. Augusta Hunt in Portland, uh, who was a uh, wealthy woman, a philanthropist in Portland, who uh, was donating money for the uh, care uh, of the Malaga Island residents and the school. Um, she actually wrote to the Lanes, to the missionaries, to say that the governor was coming uh, to visit the island. She actually wrote this, Dear Mrs. Lane, I thought you ought to know that on Friday next, the governor and council with three ladies are expecting to visit Malaga Island. We leave by special steamer at nine o'clock. Please do not let the people on the island know of this visit as I'm anxious to have the men see conditions just as they are and without comment. It would be all right for Cora to have the children in the school building when we arrive. That might be the best way for the men to see them. I don't want them dressed up, but if possible, clean in general appearance. If we have them looking unusually well on the island, it might seem as if we had exaggerated their needs. But you and Mr. Lane can give the men just what they wish to know and information. So to me, that's a letter from someone who's saying, well, the governor's coming to visit their homes, but don't tell them. Make sure no one cleans up. And you, the missionaries, can do all the talking. Now, I don't know about you, but if the governor came to visit me at my house, I would wanna clean up. I might pick up and wash all my dirty dishes and make sure my kids weren't screaming, um, but that's not what was given to the Malaga Island residents. Very soon after, um, a local doctor and a member of Governor Playstead's executive council signed papers committing Anna Parker and the entire Marks family, all residents of Malaga Island, to the main school for the feeble-minded, which had recently opened in just 1908. In that same month, the state of Maine purchased Malaga Island from the Perrys in Phippsburg. They purchased it for $471. They ordered all the residents to leave the island by July 1st, 1912. A few of them were given a small amount of money, like $50 or $100, to go find another place to live without having any real suggestion of where they should go. And they were just told to be gone by July 1st. So when the uh, agent, the state agent, and the local sheriff arrived on Malaga Island to evict everyone on July 1st, uh, they were ready to remove them forcibly. But this is the one thing I really love that the community on Malaga Island did, is they did not wait to be evicted. They took the one and only control that they could have in this situation, and they determined when they would leave. So by July 1st, they were all gone. Not only were they all gone, they also took all their houses with them. They dismantled them and removed them. And that was what they could control. When they did that, 
there was nothing to forcibly evict. So the state decided that they could sell the island. Uh, after taking the highest bids at the end of 1912, the state sold the island to the highest bidder for $1,650. Just before the sale, the state ordered the removal, the exhumation of the entire cemetery on Malaga Island. They wanted to make sure they removed all evidence, any reason for anyone to go back. So the state exhumed 17 bodies from the cemetery. They combined them into five caskets and reburied them at the grounds of the main school for the feeble-minded, where they still are buried today. One of the families that was particularly devastated by Malaga Island was the Marx family. This is Jacob Conrad Marx. He went by Jake Marx. He was a son of John Marx and Hannah Darling. So again, it's that Darling family connection uh, down from Benjamin Darling. He married uh, Abby Darling and they had four children who you can see here in front of their house on Malaga Island. On December 9th, 1911, the state institutionalized eight Malaga residents at the main school for the feeble-minded. They institutionalized Jacob Marx, Abby Marx, Lizzie Marx, Lottie Marx, Etta Marx, James Marx, and William Marx. William was the toddler son of Lizzie Marx. And they also put in the main school for the feeble-minded, Mrs. Annie Parker. The patient records for each of these individuals live here at the Maine State Archives. Uh, so one of my first roles, one of my first activities as Maine State Archivist was to have each of those files digitized and put online so all of you can have access to them and see them. If you go to the Maine State Archives website, you will find them. Um, but those, those patient files are, are very telling. Each of the people who were placed in this, in this what they called school, uh, were placed there with a medical diagnosis of low-grade moron or imbecile, middle grade. These were all scientific medical terms used at the time. Abby and Lottie were the only Malaga Island residents to be, re to be released from the main school for the feeble-minded. All the rest of their family members died there. Jake Marks died just a couple of months after arriving and his son not too long after. His two daughters lived until the 1920s, but you'll see at the list, little Willie Marks. That's the toddler boy of Lizzie Marks that according to Agent Pease should be given to Mrs. Hunt because she wants the child. The state didn't actually do that. They didn't give him away, but instead they put him in the main school for the feeble-minded at the age of three, separated him from his mother, and he died there at the age of 19. Lottie Marx, uh, who was released from the main school for the feeble-minded, uh, lived to a, the age of 103. Um, she died in 1997. Uh, she's uh, often talked about her childhood on Malaga Island, talked about it fondly, of her community and her family members, of digging clams and dancing. She often talked of having Native American ancestry, never uh, talked of having uh, Black ancestry. And she always said she wanted to be buried on Malaga Island. She is not, uh, she's buried in Brunswick. To her dying day, she denied ever having been a resident of the uh, main school for the feeble-minded. Other residents from Malaga Island scattered to nearby communities. You know, some went to mainland Phippsburg, some met, went to Bath. John Eason, who you see here, this is a picture of him in 1934. He settled in Cundy's Harbor, which is a portion of Brunswick. Um, and as you can see behind him is his house. Now either he rebuilt a house to look exactly like his home on Malaga Island, or that's his house on Malaga Island. I think that's probably the house that he took with them. What I also love about this photo is that's his dog on his lap. So Malaga Island today is a nature preserve. It is owned by Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Um, it's actually open to the public. So you all can go there 
you have to get yourselves there, which is usually the harder part, um, but it's totally doable by canoe or kayak. Um, like I said, it's very close to the mainland. There's a nice beach on the north end to land, um, and I highly recommend it as a visit for a day. It's just a beautiful, beautiful location. Uh, there's a lovely nature trail that runs all the way around um, the, the island, but I will highly recommend staying on the nature trail because there's poison ivy off the trail. So just stick to the trail and you'll be fine. I will say that there's a few efforts that are still going on to um, remember uh, and make amends for the state's action around uh, Malaga Island. In 2010, the Maine State Legislature issued uh, an apology to the descendants of Malaga Island uh, for the state's actions evicting the community. And after years of effort and advocacy, um, Rachel Talbot Ross, who is now Speaker of the House here in Maine, she was president of the NAACP at the time in Portland. Uh, she managed to, to convince Governor Baldacci, governor of Maine at the time in 2010, to go out to Malaga Island. He was the first governor to actually set foot on the island since Governor Plaisted. And when he did, and he was surrounded by descendants, he issued a heartfelt apology and just said, I am sorry. You know, Maine is better than this. It never should have happened. Uh, governor LePage uh, continued that apology when we opened the exhibit at the Maine State Museum in 2012. He issued his own apology and he actually created a scholarship fund for the Malaga Island descendants. Um, passed through the main state budget. They set aside $300,000 as a scholarship fund, uh, which I'm very pleased to say we very quickly gave, gave away and sent a whole bunch of people to school, which was wonderful. And in 2017, I was part of a group of folks who um, built this memorial at the Pineland uh, Cemetery uh, to remember the people who were buried there from Malaga Island, um, since that is where they had come from. If you're interested in finding out some more information, there is a lot online. Uh, the Maine State Museum still has um, some educational material from the exhibit on their website. There's also uh, a wonderful radio documentary that's on the um, Maine Memory Network website. I highly recommend listening to that because you can hear from not just me, but actual descendants um, who, are, who are truly impacted by this story. This is their story. Um, and they really are the, the best people to hear from. Um, and then, of course, the Maine, um, Maine Coast Heritage Trust website has additional information as well. I have, like I said, the Maine State Archives has put any of our records relating to Malaga Island on our website. I highly encourage you to look for information there. Of course, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to reach out to me or give me a call at any time. And that is what I have. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks, Kate. I think if we were all in a room together, then there would probably be a really thunderous round of applause because we have, how many people are in this? <laughs> 458 people here. And that was great. And I'm seeing a lot of people applauding on their cameras. Um, a ton of questions have come into the chat. So let's see what we have time for. Um, I'll start with the, the first one that I thought we should start with was, um, do you know how the island got its name? I get that question all the time and I don't know. Okay. And I wish I did because it's a really good question. My guess, and it is truly just a guess, um, is that the name comes somewhat from Malaga, Spain. You know, Phippsburg being a fishing community, being a shipbuilding um, and ship trade community, there, there were interactions with the entire world. Um, so this, that's the only thing I can think of, but it's totally a guess on my part. It seems like a good guess. So um, more research needed, right? Totally. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, who would have been taking those photographs? Uh, Margie asks. And were they were all of the photographs photographs staged as the example that you showed us that was a postcard? Most of them were. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one of the Eason's in front of their house um, and the one of the school building from the water looking up, those were both taken by Herman Bryant, who was the photographer and gardener. All the other ones, we don't actually know who took them. Uh, there's a gentleman in Phippsburg who owns them because his parents really early on in the 60s sort of were collecting them from local residents. Um, so they're small little pocket snapshots. We don't know who their photographers necessarily were. Mm -hmm. 
It would be interesting to know that. Um, do you know, oops, there's so many questions coming in that I can't keep track of. Do you know where the McKinney's went after they left Malaga? Yeah, the McKinney's, um, some of them went to uh, mainland Pittsburgh. Um, various generations, of course, have scattered across the country. Um, there's some descendants of the McKinney's in the Rockland area uh, now, and but some are still in Pittsburgh as well. Okay, there are just so many questions here. I'm starting to, um, <laughs> starting to lose track of where I am. Do you know where Benjamin Darling has been laid to rest? Christy wants to know. That is an excellent question, and I really wish I knew, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's okay. There's more questions, too. Uh, Christina asks, are you familiar with William and Lucy Johnson? Yes. So William Johnson uh, married Lucy. I think she was Lucy Marks. Um, I have my family tree right next to me. I had to do a really extensive family tree to keep track of everyone. Uh, William Johnson uh, is fascinating. He actually uh, came, he was not originally from Maine. I believe he was originally born in Virginia, but actually registered and served in the American Civil War with uh, a Massachusetts regiment, the famed 54th Massachusetts regiment that the movie Glory is based on. William Johnson was in that regiment. After the war, he came to Maine and found his way to Malaga Island. Thank you. Um, Renee is asking, do you know what the basis was for deciding that the folks needed to become wards of the state in the first place? Um, I think that's a complicated question because it may depend on who you ask. I think if you say there was an official reason, um, it's because according well, according to the state executive council annual reports, the community was a blight on the state um, and needed to be cleaned up. Um, I think if you ask some Pittsburgh residents at the time, it's because they were a uh, financial need. Um, and it was, you know, really straining a, a community that was already financially strained because most of their shipbuilding had left. But I think without a doubt, uh, whether it's said or acknowledged or not, there is racism at the root of all of us. Um, they were black people. They were white people living and marrying and you know, having children. And I think while we didn't see the state same reaction with other black communities in Maine, my feeling is that because they were two races living together, that seemed more threatening to the state. And so they were probably more willing, more likely um, to take action there than they did in other places. Interesting speculation and, you know, it's part of our history, right? It is. Um, uh, Mindy's asking, do we know where Benjamin Darling came from? Um, so uh, one of the descendants, Marnie Voter, who I will say tried to register for this and couldn't because there's so many people, um, but she's heard my talk a million times. Um, she did some research and found that he is um, most likely tied um, with South Carolina, although I think he may have come up through a sea captain who was based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We don't know how he got to Maine and why. Um, descendants have some really great theories and stories. I think one of their favorite stories that I hear most often from community descendants is that um, the sea captain who was the owner uh, of Benjamin Darling, there was a storm and the ship went down and Darling saved the sea captain's life. And in exchange, he was given his freedom. I think it's a lovely story. I have absolutely no evidence to show it's true or not. Maybe it is. But I think I've heard that one too. Yeah. yeah, it is a great story. I wonder if the historical record, you know, if there's still places that exist that can help us uncover that story or if it's yeah, just- Yeah, we haven't history. found anything yet that would actually connect it with Benjamin Darling specifically. I mean, there were certainly shipwrecks, um, but connecting it directly to him, we just haven't found it yet. But like I said, this is an ongoing, we'll constantly find more, which makes it fun and interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, well, a couple more questions here that I thought were interesting. Did um, did the state ever employ a medical doctor to justify the diagnosis of feeble-minded? 
Well, the state employed uh, medical doctors at the main school for the feeble-minded, but eugenics was accepted medical theory at the time. So for them, yes. Um, sorry to pause. I still am oh. kind of scrolling through a ton of questions. Um, okay, and so a question just came in. Um, have you compared Malaga to other rural Black communities in Maine through that time period? And a lot of the Black residents of Peterborough and Warren showed up on the popper rolls in the early 20th century. Um, do you, can you comment on how discrimination played a role in the poverty of rural, rural mixed race communities? Certainly, yeah, I've looked at that a bit and some others are doing some fabulous work um, on some of the other black communities around the state. Um, Peterborough is really interesting. My friend, Dr. Kate McMahon um, did her uh, doctoral thesis on it and was really able to dig deep in that community. Um, yes, there was poverty in, in black communities, certainly. Um, the state never went in and evicted everyone like they did and institutionalize them, you know, like they did at Malaga. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, but we do know that because of their race, many of these communities were not given um, the same opportunities for jobs with higher pay. Uh, they were really limited in what they could do for employment, what they were allowed to apply for uh, and do for work. Um, they were not given equal access um, to services and quality of care. So that certainly added to all of um, their economic need as well. Thank you for that. Um, I have two questions that came in that are pretty similar and they're both asking, um, how can we support Malaga and the descendants of, of the people who lived in that community? And I think kind of along with that, are there additional reparation efforts um, taking place? I love that question. And whoever asked that, thank you so much um, for, for asking that, because I think that's a really important takeaway from all of this. One thing is that I ask all of you just to be aware that these people existed, um, that this community was here. You know, part of Maine's legacy is that they evicted this community and then the state of Maine and the descendants and the residents of Maine purposely forgot about it. I mean, this really was a history that we had to rediscover a hundred years after it happened because nobody wanted to remember. And I wanna make sure that that never happens again, that we always remember that this community existed, that these people existed. And so I would ask all of you to remember that and to tell people about Malaga community. Um, I think the other thing you can do, you know, one of the things when we had the exhibit up at the Maine State Museum, we had school groups come in, which was fabulous. We were very lucky once to have um, a descendant of the Malaga Island community there that day to speak to some students. And she asked one thing of them. She said, if you take away nothing else from this exhibit, this is the one thing I want you to remember, that when you see someone being hurt or someone not treated fairly, it is your job to speak up for them. Because if someone had spoken up for her ancestors, her entire family's life would have been so different. So that's the other thing I think you can all do is speak up for others. That is a powerful reminder. And I, I think we're, you know, it's nice that we're reaching such a, a broad audience today. And it's telling to me that people are interested in, in knowing that information. Um, I know that it, we have to let you go shortly, but there's a good follow-up question to what you just said. Do you know if um, any of this is being taught in main schools right now? Oh, that is a great, great question. So let's make this the last question. Mm -hmm. um, so it is in some schools, um, mostly because of teachers who are aware of it and make a point of teaching about it. Um, a lot of the teachers are using a fictional book called Lizzie Bright and the Buckminster Boy, which is a young adult's fictional novel but it's based on the Malaga story and it kind of, it's a nice introduction. I actually highly recommend it as a good introduction to the story. As long as you remember it's, it is fiction. It's not a nonfiction story. Um, but the other thing is that uh, Speaker Talbot Ross actually put in a, a bill in the legislature last session, which required that Maine's African-American history had to be taught in Maine schools. So legally black history 
for Maine has to be taught. Um, one of the, the next efforts that Speaker Talbot Ross is working on now is to, is to um, provide that information to schools. I think one of the, the struggles for so many Maine schools is they need to teach this, they wanna teach this, they don't know where to start because most of us did not grow up with black history, certainly Maine's black history taught in our schools. Um, so that's the next effort that's happening is to really get the information and the content out there so that the schools have something to work with. So what I would suggest though, another thing you all can do is to talk to your local school districts and encourage them, remind them that they do need to teach this information. Maine has a very, very long history, a long black history. Um, we've, we've had black people here since the first colonists. So since the 1600s. Um, so it's a long, deep, varied history and we need to understand more about it. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you for this great presentation. There have been a ton of comments already coming in telling, you know, telling us thank you, how much people appreciated it. Um, to everybody whose question didn't get addressed, I'm sorry we didn't have time, but we do have to, we do have to let Kate go after this really wonderful talk. Um, I hope you'll all consider coming to our next talk, uh, February 16th. Check out our website. And um, in the meantime, you should hear from me with an email that has a link to this recorded talk so that you can reference it again. All right. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Everyone have a lovely night. Thanks, Shannon. And thanks, Lincoln County Historical Association. Thank you, Kate. This was a really, really a treat for us. Awesome. All right. Have a good night. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.